expansive visual thinking. This is, um, this is a presentation that will provide an overview of why and how producing visualities can contribute to design research and especially new knowledge, the expansive word that I'm using here, drawing from my thesis, means that we are trying to expand the boundaries of our current knowledge, but not just knowledge, but also the world itself can expand to become wider so we understand more of our world. And then our world become uh, more richer, uh, with more diversity, more things for us to enjoy and also to challenge us. So, first of all, a very simple definition of what visual thinking is. This is different what you're going to find if you search for visual thinking in design research. Some people re reduces visual thinking to a certain kind of technique of drawing, a certain kind of simple drawing style. That's not how I see it. Visual thinking in general is a way of thinking through mental, but also verbal, bodily, and graphic images. So you are thinking through these things th or thinking with these things. So it's not an end in itself. Conceiving an image like creating a graphic is not visual thinking if you don't have a third or a second or a ultimate purpose for it, all right? So it's not all graphic design stuff that falls into visual thinking the way I'm defining here. Of course, you need to think visually to do any kind of graphic design. But visual thinking means that you are thinking through gra graphic design to uh, conceive something else than graphic design. So you're using as a medium or a tool. My first example is not in graphic design at all. This is scientific visualization. It's one of the most um, difficult visualization that the humanity or humankind ever produced. Scientists, they collected so much data out of this uh, universe coming from what they now call black hole and they didn't know how they look like. Is a black hole only black? It's really black. They didn't know exactly how uh, it, it would appear on the naked eye and nobody can observe um, black hole using just a simple micro, uh, telescope. You have to have several telescopes uh, spread throughout the world. And then through a very collaborative activity, they combine those images together across almost 15 years until they got this beautiful image that you just saw. And they did so because by having an image of what a black hole is, really, it could Park a new generation of scientists and researchers to look at uh, the different qualities and characteristics and define physics. There are so many interesting characteristics about black holes. Like, for example, what happens if you fall into a black hole? You won't. It's not possible to fall into a black hole because a black hole is a distortion of time and space. So, rather, if you uh, get closer to a black hole, you will probably flatten your whole body and it will start spinning around the black hole but your body would be extended at some point it will become the size of the black hole it's just really crazy to conceive it because the physics is completely changed there and through those images you can tell the stories right so once you are here the event horizon as they call it is when these things happen. That's the threshold spot. But because you have an image, now you can conceive a little bit better the craziness of what I was telling you about. So visual thinking is definitely not the goal for scientists. They don't want to make pretty and cool pictures like this one just for the sake of it. They want, want to understand better what black holes are. But they also understand and they draw from science, from art, I'm sorry. They also draw from art that images can represent things we don't know for, or we don't fully understand. There's some kind of space for ambiguity, for um, openness. And that's why this black hole image is a bit fuzzy, right? Because we don't know so much about black holes. Maybe in the future we might get 
crisper image of a black hole just because we know which kind of waves or radiation comes from it and then we can measure it but currently we don't so in the context of science then the whole purpose of visual thinking is to expand the object of research so what are you researching black hole expanding the object of research meaning I understand black holes because my object is larger I I can encompass more of the black hole itself so visual thinking is a tool a method of doing a scientific research but it's also and uh, maybe even more uh, a method and an approach or a way of thinking design research let me give you an example a classic example of how design research produces knowledge in the world and how this knowledge stays in the world as a thing that's the Sydney Opera House it's one of the wonders of the world maybe I don't know exactly what's the number of it <laughs> it's one of the wonders of the world because architecturally speaking building up that structure in 1960s and it's still having that still standing there up to now is marvelous because you have to understand all of the characteristics of um, weight distribution and how do you balance uh, uh, according to the, wa the, the waves of the wind and all of this uh, temperature changes this all affects the quality of that construction the construction defies the 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 expected and simple way of building that will be surely easily uh, fit so many people in there but it wouldn't look so aesthetically pleasing and challenging and it wouldn't change the landscape this building is like a landmark and a lot of people goes to Sydney just to see it especially if the the building is decorated for a special occasion so every design object is knowledge about the world embedded in the world itself however visual thinking enables design research to manipulate that knowledge about the world before or after it becomes embedded into the world so it's a kind of a, a layer between the object of design and the process of designing so visual thinking is a bridge between what we know and what we don't know this has been very well analyzed in the book called what designers know by Brian Lawson not Brian Lawson <laughs> which is one of faculty members here Brian Lawson is a psychologist who studied design thinking how designers think and he has this book all about how we produce knowledge the peculiarities of our design knowledge also known as epistemology design epistemology and in that book he discuss specifically the Sydney Opera House an example I, I'm bringing now more pictures from the Sydney Opera House project the process that brought to life that building in the 1960s John Hudson he uh, submitted his idea his concept for this Opera House as part of a public competition he won the competition but then a lot of engineers managers they believe that this wouldn't be possible to build <laughs> would cost too much the um, city hall canceled the project but then since the project was public and the public really loved it there were quite some protests in, in front of the city hall to reinstate John Hudson and bring back his idea to life and the city hall ended up not uh, requesting John Utso to return to Australia and finish the project instead they commissioned a new group of engineers and architects and managers that were more like into implementation because this guy was crazy he was bringing so many new ideas that they wouldn't know if it was possible to build and he was heavily relying on sketches that are very uh, stimulating to look at very um, uh, fantastic but not maybe very buildable so as you can see in the center the very center you see an, an image of um, a model an early model that was built on based on his ideas and that was still not buildable they had to rebuild many different models until get get to the point where the the forces of nature had been mastered in a way that the building would not collapse 
So before the object of design is constructed, it already exists as images in the hands of many co-designers. And I use this word co-designers here to help you to remember that the way I understand co-design as everything which is around a design. This process of coming up with a design, every design has a co-design around it. I, I took this insight from a book written by uh, Lucky Sass, who is called Co-Designers. I really recommend it. It's a completely different way of looking at co-design. Anyway, in this book and how I understand my thesis, co-design is this interaction between the design and the process of designing. And, and it's uh, collaborative, but it's also sometimes competitive. So it's collective design. So this whole process of uh, coming uh, these different images, models, uh, people, money, uh, calculations together. This is all co-design. And expansive design tries to expand the boundaries of this co-design. So as much as Paulo Freire methods try to expand the boundaries from the text to the context, expansive design tries to help you to expand from design to co-design. In this specific lecture, I'm emphasizing visual thinking as a means, as a medium, as a tool for, or as an instrument to ex, uh, facilitate or complicate this expansion from design to co-design. But in past lecture, I also presented you Lego series play as a, a tool with the same purpose. And we're gonna see and experiment with other tools uh, throughout this research and practice course. But I want to point you out that co-design is not just about what happens before a building is built or before an object of design research is defined, but also after it's implemented and built that is still going on. Design research is never done. So the Sydney Opera House has been redesigned or reframed or uh, reconceptualized in so many different ways after it was being built. Every time they create a new image that would um, repurpose the building. For example, at the center we see uh, a protest against uh, war in Palestine, which is quite old now. As you can see, this war is still going on, but it's a, a building being used as a wall. It's a kind of a wall of where you can house the protest that the entire world could be uh, aware of just because this building is so iconic. The building was never designed to be a, such a wall, and it was a very creative way of reframing uh, and rethinking the way this building plays a role in geopolitics. So co-designers can still handle design objects through visual thinking. And all of these images you see here, they are trying to change something else, which is not themselves. They are not images for the sake of images. They are producing something else. So they are means, they are mediums, they are tools, instruments. Uh, an important insight that I got from my PhD thesis is that visual thinking helps to connect individual thought to collective thought because those visuals can be shared. And sometimes it's hard to share, sometimes it's hard to convey a message just by using words. Sometimes you have tacit knowledge that cannot be conceived into words yet because it's not well articulated. But then you can use visuals. And when I say visuals, I'm not just talking about drawings. As I mentioned before, visual thinking includes also um, uh, spoken images. If I start to talk about something and you close your eyes and you picture what I'm talking about, that's still an image. It's not anything that it would say would evoke an image. It has to be very peculiar on depicting the overall scenario of it, but this is still visual thinking. You can also use Lego, you can also use uh, theater and many other ways. But the most importantly, you are connecting to someone else's knowledge. And with that, you are expanding the boundaries of your uh, understanding of your learning. That can be conceived in as this very uh, naive um, sketches I've made before I was wrapping up my thesis. It seems that simple, like you have three people, each one of them, they are saying different things. They are conceiving the world in a different way. 
and after a while in a different situation they are now sharing and they are uh, on the same page so to speak they believe that they need to design the thing that they need there the design object should be like that but unfortunately or fortunately this is not always so simple there's some conflicts and I was very happy to have found this it was one of the most important findings in my research is that uh, design does not occur in a perfect democracy of robots agreeing with each other human beings they have different backgrounds uh, different interests and when they meet uh, and they, they gather together there will be some friction and conflicts but these come from a uh, common origins a historical region which is not just an opinion that's what I call a contradiction so by engaging that the discussion and confronting those perspectives and ideas and concepts that from that friction can expand a new thing that reframes the contradiction in a positive way many instruments as I said can be used to deal with contradictions I've tried a lot of um, interactive uh, 3d uh, visualizations that you could use using digital boards in my PhD uh, research but you can also use um, uh, sketches like these ones you can also use Lego display you can use many other ones that I don't even know but it's up to you to uh, research and collaborate with that and it's particularly useful these instruments when you are trying to reproduce contradictions in an ambiguous way if you try to reproduce a contradiction in a very realistic and precise way you are probably going to lose the contradiction because it's you're going to resolve the contradiction and make it so that it's so f easy to understand that it's no longer a contradiction like one plus one equals to two there's no contradiction there but if I say one plus one equals to three you're wondering what you are saying then there is a contradiction here but why you're saying this maybe you want to convey that the plus is also a meaningful sign it's not just the one and the, and the other one the plus adds some extra meaning to it and then you get three if you really think graphically, as a if you're a visual thinker, you should never accept that one plus one equal, equals to two. As a graphic designer, one plus one equals to three graphic signs. Well, what about the equal? Yeah, you came up with that on the spot. Aha! Uh -huh. Right, interesting. But then to grasp the equal, you need meta design. Think about it. The only way how you can say what equals equals two is that if you are considering meta equality, right? <laughs> <laughs> but while we were discussing this, had, did you have that in your mind? You are imagining this equation. I didn't show in the picture here. This is a, a verbal image, right? We all share this. It's very interesting how we create co-created this together now because it's not even part of my slides. That's what I'm talking about when I'm saying visual thinking helped us to move from individual knowledge because I only knew this, I knew this trick, I never saw this before. This came out just because we are having this dialogue now. And we also probably haven't ever thought about this, that one plus one could be read in a graphical way, right? And we are co-creating this knowledge now. And that's why it's called expansive because we don't even know where we are getting with this conversation now, right? and it's always a surprise so expansive visual thinking it is a mode of thinking that in which mental verbal bodily and graphic images are produced that's the same definition that we saw before however there's something new here the purpose of expansive visual thinking is not any kind of knowledge it's really unearthing contradictions in co-design so we are trying to get what is what is hampering our process what is bothering us let's try to make that into a visual image 
Let's work it out using those images. And to wrap it up my presentation, I want to present three cases of using expansive visual thinking. First of all, how I used it in my PhD time. So I worked with several organizations in the Netherlands to represent the contradictions of the construction projects. I want to draw attention to the very last one on the bottom corner of the screen where you see uh, you see a rock that represents nature and how they would impact nature by building or rebuilding uh, a di um, how they call it, um, a flood uh, barrier to it. So they, in the Netherlands, they live under the, um, the sea level, below sea level. So they have to construct a lot of what? the barriers. So how are they called? Dam. Dam, thanks. So they, they have quite a, some dams around their cities, and they would renovate one of them. But they were thinking about the advantage and disadvantage of having apartments on top of dams, um, casinos on dams and all kinds of ways of uh, uh, using that land. But then we thought that it was important to make the point that some of these new developments could impact nature in a way that they would not have foreseen. That's why every time it would, any kind of design choices would be um, proposed, they would have to attach a string to the rock if there was a an expected environmental impact. Yeah, it's a whole story, and there was a lot of environmental impact that they haven't foreseen before. So they had to rethink a lot of things about the project, but only by making it visually, because there were a lot of stakeholders in this project, many different participants. Each one of them had one, maybe, or two environment impacting into their minds. But once they all put in the same model, all of them, they said, my gosh, we cannot go forward in the way we thought before. So making those images among uh, collectively, so all co-designers around it can really reconceptualize the design object and change the, the course of a project. That's what I witnessed in my, in my research. But speaking of my own uh, process of doing the research, I used visual thinking a lot, only to myself, because I'm. You might think, why should I write something or, or make a, an image, if I'm the only person who's gonna look at? One thing that common sense does not get is that you are never the same person. Every time you wake up, you are a new person, and especially year after year, you change so much, and especially if you are a student acquiring new knowledge that transform your mental structure once you see those images and and uh, later on you might completely see differently and you learn more last week we saw those lego series play model videos from conceptualizing mxd uh, i don't know six months ago and now comparing how you see it now S students who are here for a while they they thought wow that is that how i saw it I didn't realize how much I changed my mind throughout those months. So that's why I built, I used, I used to make visual uh, appointments in my, in my uh, notebook. Uh, this notebook has much more visuals than what is these pages conveying now, but unfortunately I only have this specific photo now to show you. You see more visual thinking on the left side. On the other hand, you might also recognize that I'm writing in Dutch and that's that language is very hard for me to manage and have making those visuals also help me to anchor the meaning of what I'm writing about if you are dealing with a language that you not it's not your mother tongue making visuals helps a lot and actually it was one way now it came to my, to my mind how I actually learned Dutch by reading comic books yes that's what the Dutch people told me oh you're learning Dutch why don't you buy a lot of comic books and read them <laughs> they have such a fun culture, right? Reading, learning from comic books. And uh, I was attending the Dutch lessons. They have a kind of funny games, not at all about learning grammar and rules. Forget about it, just have fun with the language. 
Yeah, so I bring a, a little bit of this Dutch culture to my design research too. And I, I was trying to have fun, maybe, even if I knew that I was writing incorrectly. But anyway, this was the way I could use those uh, representations as a means to advance further my knowledge. And I also ma made use of visual thinking in my books, in my readings. Anytime I was reading an article, reading a book, I was making all kinds of representations, especially about theoretical concepts that were difficult to grasp. And I definitely recommend you doing that. That's why I ask you to print out uh, your papers you're going to read and also to use a physical visual diary because it's also giving you the opportunity to look at the text with a different mood that's not so distracting and hectic as the uh, digital uh, display would be. A digital display is almost like a world in itself. It can suck your attention totally. And if some kind of image pops out, you are totally distracted. Like uh, a message, notification, or an alarm. It's always better if you have a physical uh, thing. Another thing about uh, the physicality of it is that you will remember where you actually wrote or an, an annotation in a book just because you have that kind of... Uh, physical reference for it. So I read many digital books and physical books during my PhD. And those that I read physically are the ones that I remember the most and I actually quoted and cited more in my works. So whatever, whenever you can, you should do it. And by the way, one of the assignments that I'm going to discuss for you later on is called the book autopsy. So you would have to analyze an entire physical book in a few weeks, but you won't be able to write down them because they will be from the library unless you actually buy them. <laughs> uh, that's that's the, the disadvantage of it, but you can also put post-its on the books on the library and there are some invisible post-its, transparent post-its that you can draw on top so you can still use it. Yes, Cassie? Yeah, because I like keep library books because I like took one out that hasn't been taken out in like 20 years. So I like <laughs> keep it. Do you know that's like a thing? Yeah, some people like that. Yeah. Have you ever been able to like ask the library to keep it? Sometimes you can do that because libraries they need to get rid of their books once in a while. What? Yes, libraries ha they get they get rid of books regularly. Like, so you can a, you can directly ask. In years. You can uh, you can ask. <laughs> but can I just finish here? I'm sorry. <laughs> So I'm about to finish. So besides all of those serious uh, application of visual thinking for work purposes, I also start experimenting that as an, a, inter, a multicultural, intercultural uh, medium for dialogue. And I was using some little games, visual games to play out um, some fun, uh, have some fun activity with kids and people from other cultures that I was meeting there. So this, in this um, table that you're seeing the picture there, I'm, there are probably some three or four nationalities, people from different nationalities, and we are playing this marvelous game. Not, not everyone speaks good English there, so it's hard to speak, to have, a, a fun, to have fun with English, but we can have a lot of fun with pictures that have multiple meanings that was, we were explore, exploring that game. Uh, second case, expensive visual thinking, the Copal Plus project. Uh, it was a project hired by a uh, utility company in Paraná State, where I lived in the um, past uh, 15 years. And Hot Milk is the, was the innovation agency of uh, Catholic University. They assisted this company in communicating the contradictions in the energy sector to new startup entrepreneurs. So we use a lot of visual thinking strategies, legacy display including and um, game storming activities. In the end we got these very nice video animations explaining uh, what were the, the challenges of the energy sector to these entrepreneurs and they drew from the graphics that we sketched out in our sessions and those people sketching out they are not designers, they are not uh, even to art, they are engineers, they are managers, they are 
all kinds of professions working with us into building this common shared vocabulary. This company loved so much this way of working in a collaborative, creative way that they just started to incorporate and do it as part of their, all of their innovation routines. The, all of these pictures you see are not from workshops or classes that I'm teaching. These are themselves organizing and using visual thinking. And even they bought their own Lego sets, <laughs> which was really a breakthrough moment for them. They even decided to take a picture of themselves going to buy um, uh, supplies for their uh, company in the Lego store. And f last, the last case is expansion visual thinking, teaching design creativity at Federal University of Technology Paraná, my last job. And I taught this course for first uh, freshman years, freshmen, freshman students, first years. They um, have just joined the university. They thought that creativity was a kind of a recipe. They want to, hey, teach me creativity. And I said, well, I unfortunately cannot teach you how to be creative. You need to experience that through many different process. And while you go through the process, you may learn something and reflect about it. We tried from brainstorming visually to theater through playing game, uh, board games that explore uh, visual images. But the most important tool that I could definitely see students developing and growing their visual thinking skills and creativity was the visual diaries. And as you can see from this picture, you can already uh, imagine what I'm expecting from you in this course, in this visual diary that you're gonna handle me by the end of the semester. You should definitely try to explore how to put your ideas in so many different ways, with different materials, colors, uh, ways of sketching, not just writing, but also writing as part of your drawing. So think about uh, text as an image. And an important aspect of it, I'm not sure if I'm going to implement this specific technique, but I was using um, a stamp to give quick feedback to students. Every time I was seeing an uh, instance of visual thinking, I was stamping the, the notebooks like, yeah, visual thinking, meta creativity, which was one of the topics, visual thinking, meta creativity. And so they could know if they were actually uh, producing something that would achieve a good grade. I had to evaluate 40 students in this class. How could I do that so quickly? And if I would take their notebooks home, they wouldn't be able to use the notebook at home during an entire week. That would be too much. So I created a situation where I, I left them doing all kinds of mess in the in the classroom. I'm going to show you the video in a minute. And then, well, they were making that mess and being very playful. I was grading the, but I was grading really fast, like bam, 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 stamp, stamp, stamp. <laughs> so that's how you were, you manage to do critical pedagogy in a situation where you have limited resources. Finally, to wrap up this thought, once contradictions are visually conceptualized, they can better be understood as seed of change rather than an error of judgment. So contradictions are not enemies, they are uh, your friend because they are announcing what's up to come, what is the future to come. They are uh, encapsulated into contradictions and visual thinking is a way of making that more visible. So you can check later on the references if you're interested on. Thank you so far.